Okay, so we had way more controversial questions planned here, um, but most people that had the controversial opinions either couldn't show up or had to leave already. So we have two questions that we would like to discuss and um, that our folks here have prepared an idea on. And then if you have any questions, you can ask them. And that's kind of the final session for today. So the first question is, is there a public interest in open strategies? So the overarching question today, the overarching topic was open strategies. And we've been discussing here how it changes art and production and the music industry and everything. And um, the question is, is there a public interest in it? Should the state foster open innovation, open data, etc.? Leonard wants to say something about that. Did you listen to what I said? <laughs> I, I listened, but I didn't understand very well, very well about. So, uh, is there a public interest in an open? That's the question. In open strategies. Um, yeah, I, I would definitely agree that there is. Uh, and I might just give you one example out of my own research, because I, um, I did research on, uh, in my PhD on, on large municipalities and uh, whether they wanted to um, migrate their desktop software environments from Microsoft Windows to Linux or an open source software alternatives or not. So definitely an open strategy. Um, okay, the, the, the not so good news is um, in comparing these different municipalities, I found that most of them failed. So open strategies are not easy, even so, even even for for public par organizations. But um, what you could also see is uh, that um, what what was the consequence in that cases that succeeded, like for example in Munich, was you had more competition, you had more. Uh, Local businesses uh, being uh, more, more local businesses were involved, and uh, and the uh, and the um, products that were developed, so, for example, the, uh, there's a software tool called Wallbox um, that was available not only for the municipality that paid for it, but for all other municipalities as well. So you had on the one hand, uh, you you invested in a common public good, and on the other hand, it also supported private businesses of the of the region. And, and I say I would say this made it a win-win situation, and I think that's what public policy should be about. Okay, um, from an open data perspective, I would also agree that open strategies are really important. Like people can only participate if they have knowledge, if they have data, if they see um, what is the data that decisions are made upon. Um, and uh, for innovation, it's also important. Uh, for example, new business models, new services. If you have access to public data, um, then you can develop new models. And I think uh, open data and open strategies are really important. Also, when it comes to public transport, that was a big uh, topic in our track today, uh, open public transport data. Um, more apps can be developed, like people with special needs can get proper apps that help them to, um, yeah, to get through the city easier. So there are tons of um, options for people if data is open and available. Yeah. Um, I guess there's definitely an interest and a growing awareness, um, but there's also a need to kind of educate people about this because it's it's still not um, still people and companies are not entirely used to being open in different ways I mean open innovation still needs to be pushed um, I'm in the field of collaborative consumption people need to um, kind of get over this trust barrier that they have about sharing stuff with their environment um, so we're not entirely there yet but there's definitely growing interest and, and awareness of this topic I guess it would say whether you mean, it would depend whether you mean like on a society level, like the everyday, you know, someone walking in the streets of Berlin or, or whether you mean on a government or a, you know, like a company kind of perspective. Because on an everyday level, I mean, I bet there's millions of people out there who probably would like Linux or would like things, you know, that make you feel good now on your computer, but they just don't know about them. Like I have Ubuntu on my laptop, and so many people have been like, oh, it looks so weird. And I'm like, no, no, it's, it's not that weird. But they just don't, they don't, just don't, just don't know about it. And I guess that's 
going back to your point of education. But then on a wider scale, there's things like like aid transparency. That's something that people are becoming e increasingly interested in because people want to know where their, as you were saying, like tax money is going, whether it's actually being used for anything other than administrative costs to get you know, medical supplies to somewhere or if actually being used for stuff they want it to be used for. Um, I guess it depends on what level. See, now you see my problem. Like we have people invited that had controversial positions about this, but we all agree. So how about we try to uh, be the devil's advocate? Let's turn this question around. Is there, when is there, come up with something, when is there a public interest on non-open strategies, secrecy, protecting particular interests, right? Try to be controversial now, because you all agreed. Anybody? When is it good for the state to be secretive? When should open strategies not be applied? Like health data. Health data, so privacy. Okay, do you want to say something? Um, I think of an example from uh, archaeology because archaeologists already have the problem like if they find their subject they already destroy it so as soon as they make it open everybody goes there because we're like the big treasure hunters and the stuff is destroyed immediately so they cannot do their work and I think it's also a state affair because I mean we're all interested in our history so that stuff should definitely be protected and kept secret and not open until like the scienti scientists did their work. All right, anybody else? Maybe it's better to say how uh, the state should make public uh, their data, not to when it's possible and when it's not possible. How is possible? Because also with the health data, there are some layers, some layers of privacy that you can use. Also with archaeologists, maybe sometimes it's safer to make open, to know where are and which kind of um, archaeologist please, places are uh, in some place to make it more sure, safe, because if everybody knows that there is something there, it's more difficult to take it out from there or destroy it. I hope to be clear. All right. I'm wondering if we can really close this topic. Um, in the end, it's probably about a balance. I think that's what I hear from what you say. Um, and it's not always about completely, complete openness or full in transparency, but finding the level of disclosure that's necessary. But, but openness also means, oh, there she is. Excellent. Um, but I'm really wondering where this is going. Um, and as I said, we don't have the, the opponent to the idea here. So. Um, what I see at the moment is, is open strategies applied to, to politics, to, to science, to data, to innovation, to like whatever you come up with in society, um, we apply an, an open strategy and that's coming from the processes that we have discussed today. So f finding this boundary is, is really hard, I think. Like finding these examples where you say, no, it doesn't apply. It doesn't apply to elections. Does it? Right. It does, right? So, okay, would you like to beyond now. So Anita wanted to give us a statement of what she thinks, how, how she thinks her life as an artist and, and uh, entrepreneur will change over the next 10, 15 and 20 years due to open strategies. Thank you so much. So, um, so he was just saying that it's uh, open strategies, uh, you know, with art, with um, all different sectors, but how about fashion? You know what's coming? Your shoes are going to talk to your refrigerator, and they're going to lock that refrigerator door if you don't go running two more kilometers before you can eat that chocolate cake. And I'm telling you, your scarf, 
is going to have special nanofabrics inside and pollution protection so that when you're on your moped in Beijing and there's a truck in front of you, you can easily protect your lungs. Your clothing is going to start talking to you and telling you, oh, I think you're a little bit cold. Let me heat it up a little more. Or, oh, don't forget the condom, right? And then your zipper won't unzip, OK? So the interconnectiveness of things is coming. And I'm telling you, 360 Fashion will definitely be there at the forefront. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent examples of things that, um, that will change. Are you looking forward to this? <laughs> to all of it? <laughs> all right. Thank you. So the, the next question is kind of a follow-up question that we want to discuss is, um, we, we kind of all seem to agree that producing things in a more open way as ideally common goods is good and improves our well-being, our welfare. Now, there's a downside to this, and that is we all need to make a living, right? And I think Zara has an idea that she wants to share. Basically, well, how do you do that? How do you make a living? Well, I have less of an idea and more of a, a problem that I'd all like you to solve. Um, so, I mean, at Open Oil, everything that we do and everything we produce is all under Creative Commons. And we produce, um, like, guides to countries, oil industries that can be distributed. And we translate them. And we distribute those. And we do, like, this book, the Book Sprint, a guide on how to read and understand oil contracts. And we've put that online for free. And we do... Um, country briefings before when something big is happening for example Obama going to Myanmar on Monday we've produced a 10 minute country briefing and you can read it and you know you know as you, if you're a journalist you know what questions you need to ask and stuff but how do we make money from that it's great that we're producing all of that and it's for the public good and it's with the aim of making governments be held more accountable and generally doing doing good things but that's not paying us and what we've been discussing earlier is lots of these projects are kind of side projects or things that people do on weekends um, because they have to make a living but is there any way of making a living out of these out of producing something that like intellectual property how, how can we value the the intellectual property in a way that allows us to live off producing it rather than working something and then going home and doing something as a side project I, yeah anyone So there's a lot of trend guides out there, you know, and they labor away at building these books. Um, but how they finance it is they give that part away, but then, for example, they're hired to do, like, high analysis for these big companies, right? So if you can not only produce these books, which are informative, but also if you can can somehow, I'm going to say data mining, but that's not the right word. If there's some very valuable data that you're able to put together, you know, for that oil companies, maybe they need that information, then they would pay for some of it, and then the, for the public information would be free. So while you're, you know, rummaging away and getting all this incredible information, maybe look at the greater ecosystem to see if there's some valuable information that someone else is not spending their time at, and then see if you can sell that value to someone in the ecosystem. I, I think there are Two, two streams where the revenue can come from. I think there's a lot of revenue or a lot of, uh, of stuff is already funded publicly, for example, but still uh, people don't use open licenses sometimes because contractual arrangements prohibit that or because collecting societies uh, are stand in the way. And so I think there's a lot we could, it's, 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 you know, it's small things, but if we changed a lot of those, it would be possible that at least that part that is any, that is uh, publicly funded anyway, like with public subsidies in the cultural field or 
uh, research uh, and, and also education could be free. So that would be one part. But of course, that doesn't solve the overall problem. And, and I think that we are still in a very early phase. But, but what we can observe is that there, there are already some, I would say, revenue models emerging for a post-copyright uh, economy. Um, and I, uh, just to give another example out of my own experience, um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this great video series by Kirby Ferguson, Everything is a Remix. Has any one of you seen it? I can recommend it. It's, it's really great. So, and what he did was just, he, he wanted to make the point, everything is a remix, and he didn't just want to make the point, but he, he, built, uh, he, he, he made a four-part video series showing how everything is a remix in music, in film, in, in, in business, everything. And they, they were great. They were just, he did a terrific job. And what did he do in the last part of the series? He said, okay, so I provided this video for you. Many of you liked it. Um, I want to start and make my next uh, video project. It shall be a documentary. That is uh, what it will be about. Fund me at Kickstarter. The whole project will be released under CC. And he collected the money within 20 days. I'm also one of his supporters. He, he pledged for $40,000. So it's not, it's not it, of course, it's not a million dollars. But the only reason why I supported him is because he proved to me I can do it. And then I was willing to fund it because I wanted to see this video. I wanted it to be made. And that's why I paid. And I think this is something, it doesn't rely on copyright. And, and I think, and I don't think that, co that crowdfunding is the solution for all our problems, but at least for some. And, and I think there will, we will see more and more of those models emerge. Another potential revenue stream is since it's oil, you know, find a way to maybe have people be able to offset their carbon footprint and they could, I don't know, you know, in some way offset it through your organization. I think on a technical level, that kind of thing would be quite difficult to work out because really, if you're taking people's money, you'd have to really justify. We've you, that's another thing you'd have to be able to value, like put a price on what we've produced, to, in order to justify that it's been offset. So if you can say we, you've taken a flight that's released this much CO2, and that costs the gov the environment this much money, then how do we say, oh, we produce this guide that helps you know people in poor countries hold their governments accountable it's the value of it's it's i think it'd be difficult to value it but i see your point of kind of taking the broader ecosystem into account it's interesting um Last question. questions do you have an opinion on that is anybody of you contributing to the common good in form of wikipedia articles or free music open source software anybody Grammar correction on Wikipedia? D did you get paid for that? Okay, so you have a benefit from it. Um, but you won't make a living out of this, right? right? So just as a background story on how I came up with this question, um, I'm teaching a course on open source economics. And um, one of the final questions in this course is, if we would produce only goods in the commons, um, Nobody would get paid. Of course, people would get paid, so we would distribute the money by the state. Do you know what that's called? It's not capitalism, right? So <laughs> we would produce for the common good. We would increase welfare, but um, we don't rely on markets for that. So society changes, and the answer to that is we don't have the answer yet. Um, well, we need more open source economists uh, like you to help us answer this question. How do you think the context the larger context is important, though, where we are paying large numbers of people huge sums of money to break the global economy and then get bailed out by our various governments. So you know, I think that's the backdrop. It's not like the status quo is, is, is perfect, and we're just these flaky idealists who are kind of uh, doing something off in the corner. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that the regular economists really have a great answer to this question either, and I think that's worth pointing out. All right, thanks. Well, yeah, I, I was hoping that you all got the point that I don't know the answer yet, so. <laughs> I just wanted to say brilliant point. <laughs> Thank you.
Leonard. Any last words? Any last questions from you? Sometimes I think that the financing question is of the, like open stuff is not so much different than uh, the mechanism that goes on like for the regular economy because like as you were saying you are investing you just give a guy money because you want to see that movie and what came to my mind is the example of an old GDR car the Wartburg which was overtaken first by VW and later by Ford but they couldn't sell it because people didn't believe in the support. So that's basically the same mechanism. I'm just buying a product because I also believe in the support, but it's just, yeah, I'm also supporting a lot of other stuff that's like the system that is surrounding the, the, the product. So, I mean, if, if you see that as similar, then probably what's a big question about financing open source? Then I mean the mechanism is basically the same. Is it? <laughs> I, I agree in so far as that even outside of the open realm, it's never easy to fund a project, and it's e never easy to get getting paid. And specifically in the cultural industries, all people are getting paid badly. And and I think that's not the specific specificity of of, of open business models. And and at the same time, openness is also not the solution to this problem. I think, uh, but um, so, I, if if that was your point, I agree with you. Um. <laughs> okay, I think you have the last word. Okay, last words. Um, well, the one thing I wanted to point out to to last few speakers is um, when when we talk about producing common goods and then getting paid for them, that money is usually distributed by the state, right? The state produces public transportation, um, education and all that. Now the problem is if you would imagine an economy where we only produce common goods, what would the tax rate be? Probably close to 100%. And again, that's not really a market economy anymore. So I, the, the point really is that I don't know the answer yet, do you? <laughs> So, um, as closing words, thank you for coming and for being part of this discussion. And uh, we can all take away that there are still things that we need to ponder and, um, well, come up with solutions that are not there yet, like the post-copyright economy, the reform of patents, <laughs> and also how we value the production of common goods. Um, any last questions from you? Anyone? If not... Thank you, and I see you all at the party. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, Anina.